it's a hard thing to to come to terms with. It's a hard thing to wrestle with the good and the bad of your life. Mm -hmm. Because both of those both of those things made you who you are today. And if you don't like who you are, then maybe you can have an easier understanding of what went wrong. No, but Donnie, I, I like who I am. Welcome to On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. I am Donnie Deutsch, and this is the podcast called On Brand. And we're dedicated to a simple premise that everything today is a brand. Every person, every celebrity, every athlete, every company, every corporation is a brand. The brand is a set of values. We do two things on the show. First, we uh, interview a big personality with their own personal brand. And today it's MSNBC's Katie Turr. Uh, she's got a phenomenal new book out. Um, she's got a lot to talk about. Her life has been a wild one. We're going to talk about her life and politics with Katie. And we also do what's called our Brands of the Week. And these are the brands that are kind of shaping the zeitgeist, who's up, who's down, who's moving sideways. And let's get right to our Brands of the Week. First brand of the week, huge brand up for January 6th committee. Uh, you know, something about seeing things in living color. The good news is, and this is the big brand up, is that there were over 20 million viewers for the first one. Uh, and that's more than the Game 7 of the uh, Major League Baseball World Series last year. People are tuning in. And there's something about seeing things when they are playing out and living color. Obviously, certain things that have broken through as news. Uh, just seeing uh, Ivanka and Bill Barr talk about, no, we knew the election was real. Uh, things like that. Um, this is... I, I don't know how much of a difference it's going to make politically. I don't know how many votes it's going to sway. I don't know how much of Merrick Garland's attention it's going to move. But it's certainly a step in the right direction. It certainly has to happen for history. And I think if there's enough in there, we'll see if there are any more things to come. Obviously, this week, uh, we've got more coming. Uh, I do think it moves some minds. I think certainly not not the stalwarts, but I, I think that there's a, there is a 2 or 3 or 4% that are kind of the, the independents, that are the suburban Republicans that just see this and said, we can't have any more of this. And obviously, uh, Biden's having a rough time uh, with this economy, with everything that's going on, but uh, we'll, we'll see. This is a TBD. And obviously, just an attachment to a huge brand that for Liz Cheney. I mean, she just continues to look like an American hero. Brand down for Fox News, not even covering it. That's so frightening. We have these hearings on a government insurrection, uh, an insurrection against our government. And Fox literally is choosing to not show it to their audience. How absolutely frightening. And to make easy matters even worse, on their regular program that night with the Tucker Carlson's and the Sean Hannity's, they didn't even run commercials because they were so afraid that during commercial break, people would just kind of flip over and go, hey, man, this is kind of interesting. Brand up, although I give them brand down because I can't stand this guy, DeSantis, is beating Trump in straw polls. Uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis claimed another clean win. Uh, in This is the uh, Western Conservative Summit, uh, who they'd like to be their can uh, candidate. I think DeSantis is going to continue to rise, and I think that he's a wolf in a sheep's clothing. I think in certain ways he's even scarier than Trump because he's smarter than Trump. But everything that is bad about Trump is, is, is DeSantis, except he comes in a better package. And that's very scary that this guy is just totally frightens me. He is a genius. He has a brand up, brand super brand down for GOP congressional candidate Carl Palladino. He is a uh, he is running uh, in New York's 23rd congressional district. He's being backed by uh, House Republican Conference Chair Elise Stefanik. Uh, here's what this genius had to say. He kind of was lauding the leadership skills of Adolf Hitler. Quote, and this is a guy who's running for Congress. I was thinking the other day about somebody had mentioned on the radio Adolf Hitler and how he aroused the crowds. He would just get up there screaming these epithets and these people were just, they were hypnotized from him. I guess that's the kind of leader we need today. We need somebody inspirational. We need somebody that's a doer and has been there and done that, a doer, a killer of six million Jews, a killer of uh, millions and millions of Christians. That's what we need, a doer. It's just fucking people are running for office. Carl Palladino, there's a, there's a prize for you. Huge brand up for Matthew McConaughey. I'm sure everybody by now has kind of seen his impassioned speech uh, from the White House briefing room where he held up the sneaker of uh, one of those poor little babies that were killed in Uvalde. Of course, McConaughey is from Uvalde. And it just shows what real emotional connection with audiences can feel like. I, I can't remember any politician connecting in a way that was so... And here's a guy, he's a gun owner. Uh, and I think that's what makes it even more effective. He's a proud gun owner. But talking up there 
and the way he did and the way he connected with all of us. You know, Matthew McConaughey has a very bright future as a leader in this country. I've said this before on the show. He's talked about possibly running for governor, but he's got, as they say, the right stuff. Brand up to 220 CEOs. 220 CEOs on Thursday released a letter last Thursday calling on the Senate to take immediate action. CEOs from Dick Sporting Good on, on gun control and gun legislation. Lululemon, Lyft, Bain Capital, Bloomberg, Levi Strauss, all CEOs. And I keep saying this and I keep talking about how that corporations of America have a big role to play in how we get this country back on the right track. So that was good news there. Sad statement, bulletproof backpacks, sales soar. Um, so I guess that's a brand. I'm going to give it a brand down. That's just something, obviously. And scared parents are reportedly screaming to buy the armor bags, even at the even as much as four hundred dollars. Um, scary stuff. Uh, brand down for the economy. More than eight in ten Americans hate this economy. No surprise. Um, it's inflation. Uh, it's uh, we're heading into a recession. The, the Dow keeps tumbling. 83% of respondents said the state of the economy was poor or not so good, according to a new poll from Wall Street Journal and ORC at the University of Chicago. That's 83% who say this economy sucks. I'm surprised it's not 90%. Here's an interesting thing. Brand, I don't know if it's brand up or brand down. Brand up for the concept, brand down for us. of st- Shrinkflation. From Gatorade to Kleenex, shrinkflation is on the rise. What that means is basically companies afraid of raising prices because it's going to alert consumers and maybe push them away, they're reducing the size of the product for, that they're giving people for the same amount of money. So for instance, a small box of Kleenex that now has 60 tissues a few months ago, it had 65 tissues for the same price. Uh, Chinobi Flips yogurts have shrunk from 5.3 ounces to 4.5 ounces. Uh, Care toilet paper, which has shrunk from 340 sheets to 312 sheets. Bags of Frito Scoops, Mark Party size, used to be 18 ounces and now they are 15.5 ounces. So kind of a nifty little trick, but this really, this is a, a, a little sidebar about how the scary state of our economy that now they, we've got this thing called shrinkflation, which is kind of scary and kind of says where we are right now as a company, as a country. Manhattan rents brand up. They've, the average Manhattan rent price is hit $4,000 for the first month. That's up 25% year over year from three point. So, when you're listening across this country, you go, oh, Manhattan rents, what do you get for $4,000? That's an average. That's just like, just that's a typical, non-special Manhattan apartment, $4,000. So there is your inflation right there. Another, you know, uh, feather in the cap of rising prices is mobile home theme park, mobile home parks. Massive rent increases, brand up for mobile home parks. The average mobile home usually is manufactured has risen nearly 50% during the pandemic from 82,000 to 123,000. So 50% increase from since the beginning of the pandemic on mobile home prices. There is nowhere to hide with this inflation. Brand down for CEOs. They're enjoying huge paydays while their workers struggle to pay bills. Low-wage workers got a 3,500 raise. Uh, this is, I'm just trying, I want to get this right. Uh, consumer prices have spiraled up to a 40-year high above 80% this spring. Meanwhile, sewer pay, the companies soared 31%, driving the average pay gap to 670 to 1 from 640 to 1. Compared, that's that's the average CEO price of his salary to an average worker, 670 to 1. Um, the average CEO made $10.6 million last year. The average low work, the average low-wage worker took home 2400 bucks. Uh, brand now for tipping. Pantera gear, a bump in tipping is officially over. During the pandemic, there was obviously people were incredibly sensitive to restaurant workers and people who were going out there and risking their health. Well, now the percentage is down. Adults are in their tipping habits. A percentage of those polls said they always tip at a sit-down restaurant is now 73%, down from 77%. Similarly, 57% of respondents said they always tip their delivery person, down from 63%. And only 43% say they always tip their taxi or rideshare drivers down from 49%. Only 43% tipping right or tipping taxis or ride share drivers. Come on, that's not that's not good. Come on, we got to keep tipping. Uh, here's an interesting 5% brand up for trans and non binary youth. 5% of young adults identify as trans or non binary in the survey. Now, it's about 1.6 of the entire US population. This is according to. Uh, this is according to Pew. This is not U.S. Census doesn't cover this. But 5%, one in 20 young adults identify themselves as non-binary or trans. That's incredible. 
It's not like one tenth of one percent. That's not. This is Pew among people younger than thirty five percent. That's amazing. In 2017, 37% of U.S. adults said they know someone who's trans. Now the rate is 44%. Um, pretty crazy. Speaking of which, brand up for the Carolina Panthers. They hired their first openly gay transgender cheerleader. The Carolina Panthers are, the cheerleaders are called Top Cats. And now Justine Lindsay said in an interview that she's proud to break the down the door for future trans athletes by joining the cheerleading squad for the Carolina Panthers. So we'll give them a brand up like that. Brand out for the, for, the, for the Cleveland Browns, still not acting on Deshaun Watson. Um, the, the lawyer representing 20 foot, there's dozens of women have come out and said that he acted appropriately during uh, massages. Uh, he was cleared of criminal wrongdoing in a few cases, but the cases keep coming forward. And uh, he's making over 200 million bucks in a guaranteed contract. Something's got to be done here. You can't just let this continue to go. The NFL can't have its policy on domestic violence and abuse of women and and do all their hoity-toity commercials and allow this to go on check. So we're going to keep an eye on that and see what happens. Brand up for heat waves. Heat waves could soon have names like hurricanes. Uh, They are devastating, obviously. Um, They're actually bigger killers than floods, tornadoes, or hurricanes. And there's a growing effort to name and, and kind of recognize the heat waves, the way we do temperatures, the way we do hurricanes, call attention to their significance. Five other cities, Los Angeles, Miami, Walker, Kansas City, Missouri, and Athens, have also started piloting a similar initiative. Seville, Spain is doing it. So we're going to have heat waves with names on them. There you go. Brand up. This is a big one. This is going to be good for all of us. Apple. Regret that text message. Apple will let the iPhone users and the new iPhones Unsend or edit messages. So if you've ever sent out that message, and as soon as you're letting it go, you're going, oh no, how do I get, I gotta get rid of this, I gotta get rid of this. You can now unsend a message. You can edit a message. Now, obviously, if it gets read, it gets read, but you do have a little grace period afterwards as soon as you send something. That might save a few relationships or marriages or friendships or things like that. This is an interesting one. Brand up for Tampax. Amy Schumer is getting blamed for the national tampon shortage. Procter & Gamble is bizarrely blaming comedian Amy Schumer for a national tampon shortage. She appeared in advertisements for Tampax, America's most popular tampon brand owned by uh, P&G, aiming to normalize conversations about menstruation in July 2020. The retail sales exploded. Demand is up by 7.7%. One box of Tampax, 18 Tampax listed for $114, more than six bucks per tampon than usually paid. That's insane. I mean, I've never bought tampons, but that sounds like an insane amount of money. But there is a, uh, it's six miles more per tampon than women usually pay. Can that possibly be? One box of 18 Tampax for $114? I got to relook at my research here. That just sounds like a lot. That sounds like every tampon then is like uh, 18, it's like six, seven bucks. That I got. We got to look into this. We'll get back to you on that one. But still, Tampax shortages. Bring up a chicken. It's the only meat that everybody agrees on. In 2022, chicken consumption is expected to reach 98 million metric tons. That's more than three times the growth rate of pork and 10 times that of beef. Uh, Global chicken consumption is on track to account for 41% of all meat eating by 2030. In less than a decade, humans will for the first time consume far more chicken than any other kind of protein. Chicken, man, gotta love it. Uh, Burger King in Austria has a pride whopper with two equal buns. But you know, buns are different. You got the seeds on top and the bottom. Well, to celebrate equality and pride, gay pride, and that everybody is equal, and serving a pride whopper with two equal buns, either two top buns or two bottom buns, to promote equal love and equal rights. And finally, brand, I want to give it a brand down for Velveeta. Velveeta nail polish. That's right. The 104-year-old cheese product refers to itself as liquid gold seeking to elevate its status. It's basically pasteurized cheese product as part of UK beauty brand nails to produce the first ever cheese-scented nail polish. There we go. It's available on nails.com and amazon.com. I don't know what to say other than Western civilization once again under duress. And those are our brands of the week. Let's get to our interview with the great Katie Turr. That's right. That's that sound. That's the Shopify new sales sound. It's the sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. 
Shopify is a platform designed for anyone to sell anywhere, giving entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big businesses, customized for their needs with a great looking online store that brings the idea to life, tools to manage your day-to-day and drive sales. If you have to sell anything online, you need Shopify. It makes it easy for anyone to successfully run their own business. The best advice I can give is if you're an entrepreneur or business owner is use Shopify. Shopify instantly lets you accept all major payment methods, has thousands of integrations and third-party apps from on-demand printing to accounting to advanced chat box to, to and beyond. Get started by building and customizing your online store with no coding or design experience. Plus, with 24-7 support, you're never alone. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility Powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash Donnie, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and go full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Start selling on Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash Donnie right now. Shopify.com slash Donnie. Go for this special offer. You need Shopify. I am thrilled to today's guest, Katie Turr. Uh, Katie Turr is the anchor of uh, MSNBC Live every day, five days a week. Um, she's best-selling author already. Her Trump book was a New York Times bestseller uh, about being embedded with the Trump campaign. Um, she, her new book, which everybody has to read. I'm telling you, this 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 one is a page turn, a rough draft, a memo by Katie Turr. And uh, I will open it up by saying what I just said to you off camera. <laughs> How are you so high functioning and incredibly normal after this childhood and the way you were raised? And it's just, <laughs> your story is amazing. It is interesting. I, I My husband and I talk about it because he also had a crazy childhood. His dad was a drug dealer. Yeah, his dad was just a marijuana and, drug dealer. No big deal. Yeah. He was I mean, just yeah. no big deal. Went to federal prison. Um, uh, and we wondered with our kids, are we are we giving them too normal a childhood? Do we need to like drop them off somewhere and just leave them alone for a few days to see if they could make it in order to make them more successful as adults? We're not going to do that. But uh, I don't know. You know, I, I I saw a lot as a kid, and it was really exciting and really fun. It felt very normal to me at the time. Um, it was only when I got a bit older that I started to process it, and I thought, oh, my gosh, <laughs> some of that was great, and some of that really was not. And I found myself running away from it. I mean, I spent the past 16 years here in New York um, and barely going back to Los Angeles and and feeling really deeply uncomfortable when I was there. And I, I knew it was partially because of my childhood. Uh, it wasn't until I wrote this book that I t- totally understood why um, I had all that discomfort and why I, I had been refusing to confront it. So why, why now? Why now? Well, I mean, listen, Donnie, I don't know how you felt in the middle of the pandemic, but I certainly felt um, a little lost I, you know, our, our whole lives, which are so social, they're in studios, we're talking to people face to face all the time, we're traveling, got, just got stopped and we were forced to sit at home, be alone. My studio was in my basement. It was just me there alone. I wasn't interacting with anybody. I wasn't traveling anymore. I felt, um, I started to, all my inner demons started to come out and I th- started thinking, what am I doing with my life? Is this the right job for me? Am I happy? Does everybody hate me? Why does everybody hate me? I think everybody hates me. <laughs> um, and, and and so in the middle of this, as we're all in this forced self-reflection, um, my mom sent me a, a giant box. It looked like, you know, a small, small microwave, you could say. And inside of it was a, a computer hard drive. And it contained all of the videotape that my parents shot in the 20 years that they were in the news business in Los Angeles. So Look, let's back up 90s. a little bit. Your parents were, were helicopter journalists, uh, but you must've had a fun yeah. day. At, what did my parents do at school? Well, they're helicopter. Talk about your mom and dad uh, just in terms of what their life was like and then what you're like, you, you yeah. and a four-year-old in a helicopter flying around Los Angeles. They were the most exciting bring your parents to, to school day uh, guests. Um, so my parents started a company called Los Angeles News Service. They started it from nothing. They were, two kids, and I do mean they were kids. My dad was 18, my mom was 23. And they got a camera and they started filming news stories in the middle of the night in Los Angeles because that was the time when news stations weren't doing the work and they could sell all that footage to the morning shows. If you saw the movie um, Nightcrawler, it's yeah. that. Uh-huh. Uh, they were they kind of started doing that, um, started that whole genre. And um, from there, they wanted... Uh, a bigger business. They wanted to, you know, to sleep during the night, and they um, built out Los Angeles News Service. They hired people. They had an entertainment report. They were like an independent news gathering organization 
that would sell stuff to CNN or to local stations all around the country. Um, and then my dad thought, hey, listen, Los Angeles is a really big place. Uh, we can't get to all of these stories by car. If there are flames showing in a, an apartment fire, by the time we get there, most likely they will be out because it takes so long to get everywhere. We need a helicopter to cover news properly in Los Angeles to get to these stories as they are happening. And so my dad walks into a helicopter company, tells him his proposal. He is 25. He has no money. The helicopter company laughed him out of the room, said, what are you What are you doing? What's this business proposal? Your, your camera person is a woman. She's a girl. Like, she, How could she do this job? Sexist at the time. Yeah. Um, he walked into another helicopter company and they bit and he started Los Angeles News Service in the sky. So they started covering everything in Los Angeles from the air. And that's what people know most about news coverage in L.A. They know the police pursuits. They shot, if not the first, then the second live police oh, okay. pursuit ever in television news. Well, they were most they famous shot, also they for the, 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 the Bronco that we saw taking OJ. That was your parents in their helicopter. They, they yeah. were the ones that, that found I, I it. I think I'm telling you too much of the background. They shot OJ. They right. found OJ on the <laughs> slow speed pursuit. They they uh, shot the Reginald Denny beating during the riots. Madonna gave them the finger on her, her wedding, wedding day yeah. to Sean Penn. All of the iconic things that you remember from Los Angeles in the 80s and 90s. My parents, it's likely my parents' video. And you were up on the helicopter as a, a little kid. And you, you actually had like a little baby seat on the helicopter. I mean, a, a car. They strapped a car seat. A, a stra- they, strapped they strapped a car, a car seat, seat into the helicopter. <laughs> yeah. It, it was a wild way to grow up. I mean, I, I spent more time in the helicopter than I did in my own bed. Um, I felt more comfortable there than I did at home. And I developed um, an obsession with pools. Because I would be up there and I would be staring down and everybody in Los Angeles has a pool, but we didn't have a pool. <laughs> and so I would look and I would I would just long for my parents somehow getting successful enough to where we could have our own backyard pool. So you were you bit at that point? Did you know as a little kid that this is what you wanted to do? No, I did not. I did mm-hmm. not want to do it. My dad would point the camera at me when I was little, very little. I I played along. There's a, a really cute video of me giving a radio report for KNX. He tells me to do, um, just tells me to make it up on the spot. And I talk about a fire in San Diego and then a party at McDonald's. But once I got a little bit older, I was not into the camera. I was not into the news. I thought what my parents did was so embarrassing. Um, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a lawyer, something stable something that didn't require us to get up and leave in the middle of a meal every day, something where people weren't screaming at each other at the top of their lungs or throwing tapes, Um, something normal, especially because even though my parents had such incredible success, at the height of their career, everything fell apart. And I just said, I I can't be a part of something that where you can lose everything in a moment. Um, And so, no, I was not going to be in the news business. You had a tough, you had an exciting childhood as far as from your parents' uh, profession, but very tough at home. Very, very tough at home. I, my, my stomach was hurting, uh, just particularly with your dad. Uh, talk about growing up with an abusive dad. Uh, I mean, there's no other way to say it. Well, it's hard because, you know, I, I struggle... I struggled with with revealing this because I don't want that to be the only thing that you know about my childhood or about my dad or about me. I don't want to be, I don't want to have that label. Mm -hmm. Um, You're the victim. It's a really hard thing to, it's just not me. It doesn't feel like me. Um, And my dad was super fun a lot for a lot of my childhood, really adventurous and magnetic and the person that you wanted to spend all of your time with. Um, But, and I'm saying he, my dad transitioned in 2013. So um, everything before then, my memory of my childhood is he and everything after then. um, And when he, when my dad came out to me with the transition is she. So I just want to be clear about that. Um, Not to to offend anyone and not to have anything but respect for the change um, and for the honesty of of who my dad is. In your book, you you refer to him as Bob, everything pre and Zoe, everything post-transition. Exactly. So um, Bob, when I was a kid, was very angry. He had his own terrible childhood where he was abused viciously by his father. And he had me very young, 23. He didn't come to terms with it. And I don't think he wanted that to carry over, but it did carry over. 
And so the high pressure of the news business combined with that personality that he had and all the trauma that he was still trying to deal with um, would come out in, in sometimes, you know, batteries thrown at my mom, tapes thrown at my mom, punches thrown, screaming and yelling. Um, my brother and I got the belt when we were bad as a kid. He would just get this fire in his eyes. He would punch walls. We would, when I was very little, some of my earliest memories are of plastering over the holes in the walls in one of our first houses, um, or just hanging my mom's paintings in front of them, and we had paintings everywhere. He was volatile, and you never knew what was going to set him off. He could be super happy one second, and then something would switch, and he would be super terrifying, um, to the point where, you know, I would feel physically in, in danger, and I would lock myself in a bathroom and, and just hope that the rage would subside. And the rage fell on you, not just your mother. I mean, you talk about in the book about really when he just popped you in the face. I mean, you know, just uh, just hit you hard. I mean, that, I can't imagine. And I know you you have two little girls now. It, it It's just, it's tough to get drums around that. I've got a little a little three-year-old boy and a one-year-old Oh, I'm girl. sorry. I thought you had two girls. Excuse okay. me. I'm sorry. It's okay. And I've got two older stepkids, a 10 and a 13-year-old. Okay. Um, and the rage that my dad felt, um, sometimes I feel it in me. But I don't, thankfully, the crossover from the anger to the getting physical with my kids, I, I have a hard time swallowing. I mean, the idea, like, to, to see them scared of me, yeah. um, to see that fear, I, I can't stomach it. And... I'm not saying my dad could. I mean, he was certainly wrestling with a lot. But yeah, it would it would come out. And at one point, he, I was in, intervening in a huge fight that he was having with my mom. And I just said, enough. You know, what do you, stop screaming, stop yelling. We're so tired of you. Um, get the fuck out. You know, like, we don't need you here. I think I was 16, 17. And it, he just popped me right in the lip. And it wasn't, you know, he didn't like, cock his arm back and full force punch me. But it was, it was almost like he was trying to restrain himself and he couldn't. And I remember thinking like, you have, <laughs> you've really crossed a line. Looking back, he'd crossed a lot of lines. But I thought at that moment, oh my God, you punched your daughter and how dare you? Like, go fuck yourself. Like, get the fuck out. Um, I'm so sorry. You had to, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Yeah. 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 What are you going to do? I hate, I, I, but I know you don't want to play. You're not, you're not, you don't play the victim card. It's very interesting. You're, you're, you, you're, there's kind of a dichotomy. You, you very open about it in the book, but yet you, you in no way want it to define you. Um, and in any way play the victim card. And it, it's interesting, this kind of struggle as I'm just even looking at you. I see you have, you, you talk about it very openly. Yet at the same time, it's like, don't feel bad for me. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, and it, that's very apparent. Well, yeah, because, I mean, it's a hard thing to, to come to terms with. It's a hard thing to wrestle with, the good and the bad of your life. Mm -hmm. Because both of, those, both of those things made you who you are today. And if you don't like who you are, then maybe you have an easier understanding of what went wrong. No, but, Donnie, I, I like who I am. Yeah. I, That's apparent. I like where, where I am. I have... Four great kids. I have How old are your step two stepchildren? Thirteen and ten. Right. And everybody get the whole blended things working, the whole deal the whole deal it's with working, you and Tony. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's working. I mean, the the age difference between the older kids and the younger kids is so so big that the older kids, um, I don't think they feel they sort of threatened by them at yeah, all. Yeah, that, that they works also out. they're they're very they love them. They have a lot of fun together. Um, but no, I like my husband a lot, and I feel like I got really lucky. <laughs> you tran you 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 mentioned very casually, and it's like, well, my father transitioned in two thousand and thirteen. That's that's kind of a big deal. Uh, talk about that conversation because that's not one that most of us have. Yeah. Um, so on top of all of this uh, rage and tumult and inconsistency. Uh, with my dad, and it had been getting worse over the years. After I moved to New York, uh, my dad felt, I think, felt like I had abandoned him um, and that I wasn't 
I didn't like him. And so I think he felt hurt and wounded by it. And I certainly just felt like I, I needed to, to leave so I didn't drown alongside of him um, because he was falling apart and wanted me to be everything to him, his, you know, his partner in business and in life and his mother and everything but his daughter is how I felt. Um, so in 2013, our relationship had already been pretty strained. Uh, our conversations always felt like they were on a knife's edge. They were okay as long as I didn't say the wrong thing. Um, and so in 2013, I was covering the Boston bombings. It was a big news story. And I hadn't heard my, from my dad in a few days. And I'm sitting in the hotel room, finally getting a chance to just sit down for a second and eat. And my dad calls, and I, I thought he was calling. I imagine he must have been calling to talk about the story, maybe. And instead, my dad called, and he said, Catherine, are you sitting down? And I said, yes. <laughs> I'm sitting on my bed. And he said, I, I'm not a he at all. I'm a she. Um, I'm a woman. And um, I hope you can accept that. And I remember in the moment thinking, oh, my God, this must be a joke. Because my, my dad had always kind of done wild and crazy things. Mm -hmm. He'd always also been jokey in, in extreme ways. I thought, oh, it must be a joke. And he said, and at the moment, it was still he in my head because it's really hard to make the, the switch from a he to a she pronoun in, in, that, mm -hmm. in that precise moment when it's somebody that you've had so much history with. And so he, she said, um, no, it's not a joke. Um, this is who I am. And it's a good thing because I'm going to be better. I'm going to be... I'm, all that rage will be gone. Yeah. And um, this is what's going to make it better. Me becoming my true self. And um, I, I thought that was an opening to talk about that rage. Which is something that I didn't, you know, when I talk mm -hmm. about how the, the conversations were always tense, it's because that was always weighing on my on my mind it's like all that we had grown up with and and that residual anger that i had from it that frustration that just that i that had that resentment that i had toward my dad because of all of the tumult of our past and so when my dad said i i, I this rage will be gone it's already gone because i'm changing I'm taking hormones it's, it's moving away um and i've accepted who i am I thought, okay, fine, that's great. Let's do it. Let's move forward. Let's let's have a new relationship. But I was also cautious because I didn't think a person could just change whole hog in, in a moment. Did you, at that moment, was there a cathartic kind of, oh, he gets a little bit of a pass because this was obviously a, a somebody who was suffering in yeah. their own skin? Yes, yes, 100%. Yes, yes. How's the relationship now? It doesn't really exist. No, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry, Katie. I really Yeah, am. it sucks. Yeah, it does suck. It sucks. It does suck, but it, it, it... I understand why people... It sucks. It's estrangement. And and listen, it takes... A lot has happened since 2013, and it takes two people to not call. Um, so I'm sure there's... I know that there's some responsibility I have here, but... Hopefully, yeah, we've been estranged now for hopefully, hopefully that that, a while. that takes a turn. So let's move to the career, the, the, the life and times of the Katie Turk career. You started in local. You started it. Was the local news before the storm chaser or after? Which 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 yeah, came? Yeah, local you, news before. Okay, local. Let's. I want. I what would really hit me about and you did a lot. Of, I remember you was doing stand ups in New York at WPIX and WNBC and what the story that blew me away because it wasn't from 1953 it was from 19 it was from 2010 or I, I, give or take a year or two or 2008 or 2000 that there was a story about the local news director or or whoever he was tell, taking out his book in a binder about what your hair should be like and the size of your breasts and things like that I, this was not from another century that was like 10 or 12 years ago it was 2006. 2000, okay. It was 16 years ago. I mean, that was not another, another, another era yet. That, talk, talk, no. Take me into that room with you. 
but it felt like another era. So yeah. I was a I was applying for a job at News Twelve, uh, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and I um, had gone through the reporter trial. You have to like produce a whole tape and prove that you can do the job on your own, which is shooting and editing and reporting and writing, doing everything. Um, and so I made it to the trial. They were going to offer me a job. Congratulations, but you can't be on air. Your face cannot be on my television. Your voice can, but your face cannot be on TV until I approve the way you look for television. And I sat in this guy's big office in the Bronx, and he leaned back in his chair, and and he just said, you know what? Your boobs are too big for your clothes. (laughs) And he might not have said boobs. He might have said breasts. He might have just gestured with a pencil. I don't remember exactly. But in the moment, it was, your boobs are too big. you got to find some different clothes. And I I nodded my head, and I thought, what an what an a-hole. Also, like I guess this is just part of the <laughs> this is just part of the deal. Right. I mean, the guy had a reputation. Um, for yeah, he had a reputation, let's just put it that way. And um then he handed me a a binder full of pictures of women. <laughs> I joke in the book that it was like, you know, Mitt Romney's binder full of women. This was a right. binder full of right. women. <laughs> and the photos were um, like the, the type that you would see on the wall in a salon yeah, at a mall. Black and white headshots. headshots and they were yeah, all yeah. like, you know, short blonde haircuts, very severe bobs and streaky highlights. And at the time I had this, you know, I've got my hair now. Normal hair, this longer right, right. hair. And I thought, oh God, I really don't want to cut my hair. And I tried to avoid it. But after a few weeks, I realized that I did want to be on air. I had, I'd have to do what he said. I brought it to the salon and, and the... And the stylist looked at it, and he was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> where's this 1983 picture coming from?" Oh my god, he's like, it's "Amazing, what is this? it's amazing the dopes, the dopes in our business." I mean, it's not even him. I mean, I had an assignment editor at one point at another station say to me, "Hey, do you? I want to send you out in this story on on pole dancing because it's a new exercise fad, and and I want you to participate. Do you have stripper heels at home you could wear?" And I remember thinking, like, "Oh, <laughs> oh." <laughs> This is gross. Stuff us guys Ugh. don't didn't have to go through. Talk, yeah, Donnie, did anyone ask you if you have stripper heels? Nobody asked me if I had stripper heels. Nobody asked. I I was. It's interesting because it's not been talked about a lot. I do remember in business when I was running my ad agency by being um, uh, objectified by female clients, and you you know you kind of have to flirt back. You know, there you're on the on the sell side of the equation. So you know, I remember what, I worked for this woman pub, publisher of a big magazine and she was older and I remember walking into a room and she and it was all women and she said to her, uh, her colleagues, this guy's got a great ass. Donnie, turn around. You know what I mean? And I just remember like, and then what did I do? I turned around, you know, you you do what you got to do. Because well, you you feel the pressure in the moment yeah. to, 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 to accept whatever the person in charge is saying yeah. because, you, you know, they're in a position of power and yeah. like, and you need something that they have. You yeah. are trying to get something they have. And in this case, you know, she was business, the business that you needed. Yeah. And for me, it was, I wanted to be a reporter. How did the pop come from local WNBC to the, the call up to network? Um, I was working at local and I got a chance from Brian Williams who had watched was obsessive about local news. Yeah, and he, said he started local. Cover Brian story. was started was a CBS exactly. anchor in New York. And he's yeah. a huge supporter of local. The best news. guy, one of the best. By the way, for our viewers, one of the best guys around. I mean, you what you see on TV Hands is down. like just and, and fu- one of the funniest people alive. Generous, just and we're going to see our next act pretty soon from Brian. I think he's wonderful, and I hope he does something along the lines of late night because he is very funny. Yeah, and if I very predict, dry. I think he ends up on a cable Bill Maher type thing. Uh, that's where I would have to predict he ends up Is going, it James you know? Corden leaving? Maybe that's for he'll land. Good land there. Good land there. It wouldn't be the craziest um, thing. And it, would he be great at it? He's really, he's great, a great interviewer. He's funny. He's got great banter. Anyway, so he, so I met him at, a few years before at the Olympics and I had showed him a, a story that I did and he liked it. And so I was on his radar. And a few years later, when I was at WNBC, he said, do you want to do a story for Nightly on the 2nd Avenue subway? It'd be great to, to get you into, into the mix. And I grabbed the opportunity. I was thrilled by it. After that, ABC saw it. And ABC said, OK, hold on. Let's hire her for, for ABC Network. I think they were in kind of a war with Brian. Right. There was some personal animosity there. Um, and then Brian said, no, wait, hold on. She can't go to ABC. She's got to stay at NBC. <laughs> And I, I was able to to jump from local to network. Um, it was awesome. I'm so happy. 
And I don't want to say a big break, but a, a, a serendipitous moment was when they tapped you to like, all of a sudden there was a lot of noise coming from this crazy candidate named Trump. And, you know, all of a sudden it was, maybe we should have somebody out there on, on the trail with him. Talk about how that came about. I was living in London, Donnie. I was supposed to be right now a foreign correspondent living overseas, married to some French guy. That that right. was that was my life's trajectory. Right. And then I got totally derailed when I came back to say hello and Donald Trump announced he was running for president. And NBC said, well, why the hell would we put a, a political reporter on him? He's not going to last more than a few weeks. We'll put Katie on. She's here. Right. She's not doing anything. <laughs> And so I got I got put on it. My life got turned around. Obviously, the country's trajectory got turned around. Was there around. a moment you remember covering him where you went, wow, this is there's something, we're not in Kansas anymore. Something's happening here that is something I had not anticipated, the world had not anticipated. You were because you, you were there. I mean, you were feeling it in a visceral way that not that yeah, obviously we, we lived it all on TV and we, and I've known him for years also. But do you remember a moment where you were like, this is this is serious stuff? Yeah, so very specifically, it was John McCain. When he was going after John McCain in the summer of 2015, um, the writing, everyone said, was on the wall. You can't go after John McCain. Yeah. You can't go after another Republican. You can't go after a war hero, especially. No way. Republicans will not stand for it. He's done. I got a call from somebody at the RNC saying he is done. He's never going to make it. He's out. This is going to be over in a couple weeks' time. Um. And I went to a rally in Mobile, Alabama, a few weeks later, a few days later, so close after. And there were more than 20,000 people there lining up all night, waiting in the rain and the heat to see Donald Trump. And I asked them, do you care about the McCain comments? I don't care. Screw McCain. Nobody cared. Yeah. And it felt like there was a real disconnect between what the assumptions were of the party and what the voters of the party actually wanted. Do you remember a a particular conversation you may may not, may probably never made the air? You had with somebody at one of those rallies that was kind of one of the most frightening conversations you ever had. We, we, we look, we've seen Ed Noisy, the Trump voters, the the, the the MAGA. I'm not talking about Trump voters because a lot of decent people voted for Trump, but the crazy MAGAs that we see. Do you remember one conversation where you went, "Whoa, whoa"? It was not. It was not at a rally. It was actually at the RNC convention. Um, in 2016, and it was from a, a lawmaker, a Republican lawmaker. Um, and I was talking to them about Trump, and he looked at me and he said, this guy's nuts. I I would be afraid to give him the nuclear codes. Yeah. Well, this guy's crazy. And it ended up being one of the people who would defend him publicly. And I remember thinking, holy cow. <laughs> holy cow. Yeah, more holy cow. What an about face. And it was... It was jarring. So we've spent, we collectively, the media have spent, you know, millions of hours on the air analyzing, you know, why Trump, why this happened. And I'm just curious, in your capsule, as somebody who covered it and is spending five hours a week on the air, you're going to explain in one thought the birth of Trump and Trumperism. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. I mean, I think that's, that's something for for people much smarter than me, much farther into the future. I, I think that we're still coming to terms with it, Donnie. I don't think we fully understand it. There's a there's a large section of the population that thinks he only came to power because the media gave him so much attention. No, no, no. Why, why, really the media that. that was the tool that it happened, but he, you know. Yeah, yeah, but I think he tapped into a real angry, disaffected portion of the population who didn't want to hear nuance, who wanted to be told that they were right and that and that their discomfort with the country changing was justified and mm -hmm. righteous. Mm -hmm. um, and that the problems of the world were not as complicated as they were made out to be. You just need somebody strong to come in and clear it away. Yeah, I, I think it's the simple... I mean, and there's all sorts of stuff wrapped in that. There I mean, is, it's, but it's, it's, it, I, it's as simple as the autocrat playbook in, in the sense of that if there are enough unhappy people in a lot in life, you tell them it's not your fault. It's the brown person's fault. It's the media's person's fault. It's the it's, it's the, the other's fault. fault. It's Whoever the other. it is, create another. Yeah. Uh, and then the playbook from there, as far as discredit the media in terms of falsehoods, in terms of I mean, it all comes from there. But it came down to as we as a country are moving to a obviously we're part of a global world and we are moving to a white minority country and we are moving to a country that is divided between elitists and non elitists and it's just. It's not that complicated, and what's it's here to stay, and it's bigger than Trump, and it's it's. I actually think right now, and and 
the scarier characters are the DeSantis of the world. Because to your earlier point with Trump, some of his powers, you can take away because you go, he's crazy. And you see, you see him doing the crazy. The ones who are packaged better, like DeSantis, but who have, from my vantage point, some of the evil kind of cornerstones that Trump has are actually more dangerous. And we're, we're in crazy times. That The fact that people don't understand how precarious our democracy is right now and what is happening in the state legislatures right now is scarier than anything we can even watch in the January 6th hearings, that it's being teed up to turn the elections around. I mean, had he been smarter last time around, had the right people been embedded, our democracy already would be in tatters. And we are heading towards that. It's, it, I, I hate to be a doomsday guy, but it's the writing's on the wall. It's frightening. Listen, I, I've heard the same um, worries about DeSantis from a lot of Democrats out there who, who would talk about it. Republicans say, no, he's, he's great. Um, and that's the world we live in. You know, the Democrats see, see, see something and, and Republicans see another. Um, and then journalists have to come in and try and sort it out. And, and it's hard to do so. Um, it can be difficult to do so. Uh, but in terms of the country, I am, I'm where you are. I'm yeah. terrified. Yeah. I, I'm I, terrified about where we're going. I'm a little older than you. And I, I've seen a lot of iterations. It's, it's, I, 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 my stomach hurts. My stomach hurts. And I, I, uh, I was one of the first ones on the air to do, Nazi Germany comparisons, not that Hitler was, was I mean, not that, no pun intended, uh, not that Trump was Hitler, but that the parallels of any autocrat and anything, and, we, and nobody guarantees, we're the longest democracy in experiment going today, and there's no guarantee for the future. And and that's, what do you, what do you feel your job is every day when you come on at two o'clock? This is part of why I felt so lost when I decided to write the book. Uh, and, you know, it was after the insurrection and I was on air for the insurrection, and I, um, no, I, the insurrection happened while I was writing the book, and this kind of solidified it. Um, no, insurrection happened before, <laughs> or the process, sorry, I'm getting my timeline confused. But watching the insurrection happen in real time, I was on the air with Chuck and Andrea during this, and seeing it, seeing it go from just a bunch of people marching down the street to a bunch of people throwing punches at cops and and trying to spear them with American flags and pepper spraying and then breaking windows and marching through the halls of the Capitol and, you know, and, and, and the terror of what could have happened that day, it didn't make me feel better that it was stopped. It made me feel worse that it almost happened because it felt like it was only stopped by chance, mm -hmm. by, by just a, a few quick decisions here and there that were made that made it okay in the long, in the short term, at least. But if you consider what we are about to confront with not just the 2022 midterms, but the 2024 election and the changes in the state legislatures, as you mentioned a moment ago, uh, and the people who are being installed in positions of power over the elections, I think our job is to be as clear about what is happening as possible to shine a light on all of the changes that are being made so that people are aware of what might get taken from them and how it might get taken from them. And I don't think we should do it with hyperbole. I think we should be very precise in our language. And I think we should, we should be very sober in our coverage so that there's no, that you can't just look at a person and say, oh, they are being hysterical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I worry about being written off as hysterical by some people in the public who don't see it as much of a threat as as we do, because frankly, it's it's a difficult thing to process that we could be about to lose something that we value so much. It's a scary thing to have to. And that's why it's not being try and overcome without being a psychologist that things like that that are too overwhelming for people to deal with, they kind of push aside. Whereas if, if you and I were, yeah. were just professors and we were laying it out, you go, there's actually more of a chance of this happening than not happening. Yet it's very hard for people to process. And we put this against a backdrop of, of the shootings of Roe v. Wade turning backwards. When you have talked to Republicans, because there are a lot of decent Republicans out there, and because I always ask this whenever I have a Republican lawmaker on the air or I, or I bump into a woman, like, do you, how do you, how do they just, have you had discussions with Republicans where you go, guys, how do you justify, how do you go home to your wives? How do you go home to your children where you won't move a gun law to make it 
at least 21 years old for somebody to buy a weapon of war? Or I, you and I can finish those questions. Do they, when you get them personally, do you ever get anything different out of it? Because we see them on the air and we see the question, whether it's, it's a question about row or it's a question about shootings or it's a question about the insurrection where you want to like shake and go, look, we're not that different. We both, we're all fucking human beings here. You know, this is a, and we can disagree about fiscal policy. We can disagree. No, no, like, do you ever get that human side of them where they, well, I just can't, you know, and here's why? Well, I think it depends on who you're talking to. Um, I think that there are, are this is a different, this different stratum um, of lawmakers and what they believe or what they claim to believe. And, and when I would ask, Republicans in particular, about a lot of what Donald Trump was doing off camera, behind the scenes, they would say to me, well, you know, I don't like the way he does it, but I I like a lot of what he stands for. And if you cut out the noise of the tweets and the language and the threats and that bombastic personality, so if you cut out Trump from Trump... (laughs) uh, well, I like his fiscal policy and I like what he's doing with tax law. And I I think that he's right about the Iran deal. And I think that he's right about uh, Obamacare. We got to get rid of it. And all of, they would just focus on the policy that, that happened to align with what he was mm-hmm. saying. And they would try to cut out the rest of him. The problem was it, Trump was the only reason that Republicans were in charge at that point. And, and not, it's not, wasn't, it wasn't the policy positions. That that wasn't what got him elected. No, of course not. What got him elected was his personality. Yeah. And and the way that he spoke about things, the, the way that the Republicans in Congress didn't like the way he spoke about things. They thought it was, you know, offensive or unhelpful. This is what they would say, unhelpful yeah. or noise. <laughs> unhelpful. But that was the reason that he was in the position he was in. And so, you know, I, I, it was frustrating to have those conversations in private and not get them in public. I mean, and that's not for lack of trying. It's because Republicans so infrequently, um, as time went on, wanted to come on air and defend any of it. Yeah. But they didn't want to come on air and be asked these questions because it was hard to defend you it. Can't, you can't. You don't have a crystal ball. You think he's going to run again? I, I So I, here's what I think. I think there's no way that he's going to want to hand over all of that power to Ron DeSantis. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good way of answering the question. I just can't imagine taking that. That's a good yeah. way of answering the question. Where, it, And it, it's very into Trump's psyche because Trumpy's psyche is much more about the fear of losing or the fear of giving something up than even what he would acquire. Or being weak. Be, being weak, weaker and than it's, somebody else. Yeah. But the only thing that would stop him is his fear of losing another election where, and really being branded as a loser because that's his— But I, I don't, really I don't, don't think, think that would stop him because I don't think he thinks he lost. Yeah. You genuinely, you genuinely believe that that he he himself doesn't think he lost. I think he probably knew at the time, right? But now, now after all of this time, it, yeah. he has been able to convince himself that it was a big lie, and he has a bunch of yes men around him who yeah. tell him that it all was a big lie. Yeah. So what do we got coming up? What's next? You 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 do your hour every day. You've just got this big new book out. This by by the time this airs, this book will be out. Um, you've got uh, Tony DeCoppola, this amazing husband, this great family. <laughs> Um, you're very young. You have a lot in front of you. What 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 are we gonna prognosticate for the future? Those are some big questions. Um, I'm actually actively thinking about it because the business is changing so much, and um, who knows what it'll look like in, in the next few years. And I'm trying to figure out w- where I want to land within it. Yeah. What I'm most excited about, what I want to do, and and you know that's I've got some ideas. Okay give you a bit of a cliffhanger, but I won't spoil any of them. I won't let you know them until they're okay. more fully well, Katie through. Turr, I am a huge fan. <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you are. and You've got a lot going on and it means a lot to me. I hope this wasn't too painful. The book is Rough Draft, a memoir. Uh, you gotta, if you're if you're just interested in anything from raising children to careers to the news, there's, there's a lot in here. This It's really a great book. Everybody's gotta go get it. A lot of people write memoirs and uh, but yours is so fucking damn interesting. <laughs> it's like, it really, your story is a great one. So everybody's just got to get this one. And, and this is this is great summer reading. It's a fucking good read. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have done a blurb. I'm going to put that on the back. It's a fucking good read. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Katie, I appreciate it.
I love being on with you. I miss talking to you, buddy. It's good yeah. to be on. Thank anytime you, so you want, anytime you want me on, I'll, I'll make I'll, I'll clear my afternoons. Right. <laughs> Great. Good to see you, Katie. You stay well. Bye, Donnie. Thank you for listening to On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. I uh, hope you enjoyed our interview with Katie Turr and our Brands of the Week. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you get podcasts. That's rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you get podcasts, Spotify or Apple. And watch our videos on YouTube. You can also subscribe there and please leave comments on YouTube. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week on On Brand. Everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand. And just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.